So I know today is Valentine's Day, but we don't really get a love sermon today. If you want a love sermon, we actually did that on Wednesday for Ash Wednesday. Um, and we, we talked about how God is so different from us. He's creator and we are creation, and yet God loves us. If you want to catch up with that, uh, it's on the website at oakdalechurch.org, and you can just look under media if you want to catch that. And really, as we are in this series, Sinners in the Hand of a Forgiving God, that's where we have to start, is with love. It starts with love. But we're going to keep on moving this Sunday. And I want to start off with a story. There, uh, there's a story I read. It was about uh, this uh, basketball coach from North Carolina State. Um, his name was Jim Valvino. And he had this certain philosophy with his basketball players that winning was everything. It was important to get the W. You have to win, you have to win, that's what's important. And he got arguments from his players quite often because they didn't feel that winning was everything. They said, it's also, they've been taught as they've come up, it's important how you play. Do your best, be a good sport, all that kind of stuff. It's not just about the win. And he said he would butt heads with them on that. He said, no, you've got to win. That's the most important thing. He said, no, we have to play our best. We need to work hard. And that kind of went on. That was just his philosophy until he, the coach, got terminal cancer. And he got terminal cancer, and this was something that he realized he, from a physical standpoint he was not going to win. And he said to a reporter later, he says, I realized those kids were right. It's the effort, not the win. And he said he wished he had had that awareness earlier. I want to propose to you that they're both wrong. Now, they're also both right. See, it doesn't have to be an either-or thing. It's not, oh, the effort or the win. It's do the effort and get the win. We don't have to choose between. Now, not every time that we put in the effort will we get the win, but both are important. It's important to try our best, and it's also important to win. And I'm glad we have a God that both puts in the effort and he won. That's something that we can count on. See, in Christ also, we both try our best and we get to win. That's what we're going to be looking at when we are uh, in Luke chapter 4 today, verses 1 through 13. I'm going to read this passage again. It's the temptations that Jesus faced. Verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. Here's this first temptation Jesus is facing, and it's physical desire. Jesus is just off the high point of his baptism. Jesus has gotten baptized by John the Baptist. This is inaugurating the start of his ministry. God the Father has spoken from heaven in front of all these people and announced that this is his Son in whom he is well pleased. The Holy Spirit has descended on him. You think he'd be ready to just be sent out into ministry and do great things, but no, the Holy Spirit leads him out into the desert. And he spends 40 days out there being tempted by the devil and fasting. Now, he says he's tempted for 40 days. It's not that he fasted for 40 days and then on the 40th day he was then tempted. He was tempted all along these 40 days. But on this 40th day, he is now especially hungry. And so the temptation is to get some food. I'm hungry, Jesus. Aren't you hungry? I'm hungry. Why don't you just take this stone and just make it 
You don't have nothing fancy, just some bread. Aren't you hungry? I'm hungry. It's hot out here. Jesus does have the power to perform this miracle. And it's in fact, this in the day was considered something that would be a very common miracle that somebody who was a magician should be able to do. This is an easy one, Jesus. Everybody does this. Just turn the stone into bread. Now this is something that you have all faced. You all faced it last week. You've been in church for about an hour and a half. It was getting close to lunchtime. You're starting to feel hungry. Church is over. You're going to go downstairs and get some coffee before you have Sunday school. And here comes my daughter. She's walking around looking so cute. Turn this paper into a Samoa Girl Scout cookies. And she's going to do it to you again today. Girl Scout cookies for 40 days. Temptation. Yeah, I realize I have just compared my daughter and Girl Scouts in general to the Satan. <laughs> but if anybody is on a restricted diet or trying to lose weight, or for Lent you have chosen to fast from sweets or chocolate or caffeine, you all realize that thin mints are of the devil, right? You're <laughs> Jesus, aren't you hungry? And Jesus answers with scripture from Deuteronomy 8.3. Man does not live on bread alone. What does that mean? He says, Satan, life is more than food. Life is more than just my bodily desires. There's more to being human than just the physical. God made us more than just bodies. We also have a spiritual side. Now, Jesus is not saying that the physical is bad. That's Gnostic. He's not saying that bodily desires are bad or having a body is bad. He's just saying there is more to life than just my body. I need God, too. One of the things I've been told as far as dieting, and I'm trying to learn to live by this, and my daughter doesn't like it when I say it to her as well. If you're not hungry enough to eat an apple, then you're not really hungry. You're just bored. So hopefully that's going to help me a little bit. You know, are we really hungry or are we just bored? Human bodies, our bodies are designed to let us know when we need something. Or also when we're physically mature enough for something. Not always mentally mature enough for it, but at least physically mature. You know, there's a range of types of physical desires we have. Some things are just purely automatic and necessary for life and for an individual. And then some things are necessary perhaps for the species, but we have more control over them. Your body tells you to breathe, and we don't even think about it. Your body tells you to blink. Now, we can, we can hold that one back a little bit, but we have to blink so our eyes can get moisturized. Our bodies tell us when we're hungry. And that's when we start to move away because sometimes we start to feel hungry when we're not actually really hungry. We just need to, well, do I, am I hungry enough for an apple? Maybe with some peanut butter. Our bodies tell us when we're thirsty. Our bodies tell us when we need to get away from pain. Now, sometimes we can take the pain, but what does our body tell us? What's our physical stimulus? If it's hot, move your hand away. If it hurts, stop, get away. We have more control over that. Our bodies tell us sometimes that we need touch from another person. Our bodies tell us that we are mature enough for sexual activity when we get to that stage. So there's a range from automatic and necessary to more control. And what we need to realize from Jesus is humans are more than just 
chemical and neurological responses. I have this feeling in my gut, and so I have to act on it. That's, we're more than that. 1 Corinthians 6.13, Paul shares with us a philosophy that they had in the day that the Greeks had. Food is for the stomach, and stomach is for food. That was the philosophy. So, my stomach says I'm hungry, so I should put food in it. That's what food is for. That's what stomachs are for. But they applied that broadly. Because what that implied was also, while my body is for sex, it's for sex, it's for my body. So whenever I feel like having sex, I should just go do it. Whatever my body tells me I should do, I should just do it. Because that's what my physical body is for. But Paul goes on and expands that in that verse, 1 Corinthians 6.13. He says, food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. The body is not for immorality but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. He says, we need to think more than the physical. Why did God give us bodies? Because we're for God and God is for us. Think bigger than just our desires. See, the power of Christ, what he showed us when he overcame that temptation from the devil, is the power of God, the power of Christ, supersedes the needs of of our physical bodies. One of the things I said that our body has a desire for is to get away from pain. And yet, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, with the presence of Christ, stood in the fiery furnace. They weren't running. They're, if they were just relying on the physical, they would have been screaming. But with the power of Christ, they could just stand there, and it didn't hurt them at all. The power of Christ supersedes our physical desires. The desire physically to sin is defeated. Jesus wins. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and self-control. Part of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Jesus wins. And so we win the power of self-control. That's a good trophy to have. Verse 5 of Luke 4. And he led him and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Verse 9, And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So Jesus says, overcome physical desires with regard to temptation, and now it's aspirational desires. Aspirational desires. The first one is to have security in this world. The devil shows him all the kingdoms of the world over which he has authority, and he offers all that authority to Jesus. Jesus, you will rule everything. As long as I rule you. We can both have what we want. Jesus, this is a win-win. You get the whole world back for God. And I just get you. One thing. And you don't have to go through all the pain and suffering. This is easy. But Jesus answers from Scripture again. Deuteronomy 6.13 and 10.20. It says, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. 
See, with regard to physical security, Jesus real or, or yeah, security of this world, Jesus realizes it's not really a win if you lose your eternal security. If I give up my eternal security for worldly security, I've lost everything. And so Jesus wins. He says, I serve the Lord God only. But there's an even greater aspirational desire that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, and that's to be like God. The devil takes him to the pinnacle of the temple and quotes Psalm 91, 11 and 12. And he quotes it really out of context. God's protection in that psalm is for events that happen to befall his servants, not an excuse to go out and make dangerous decisions. Just to force God to prove himself. And Jesus realizes this, and so he quotes again from Deuteronomy 6.16, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. What does Jesus say to this aspirational desire to be like God, to make God prove himself? Jesus said, let's just let God be God. And I'll be he. Jesus wins again. Now, just like physical desires, aspirational desires are not by themselves evil. I want you all to aspire to great things. Young people, go to college. That's good. No matter what age you are, get a good job that fulfills, fulfills you, what you want to do, and makes money for your needs, and makes money even for your wants. That's okay to want that. To have a spouse that you love and loves you, it's okay to aspire for that. That's good. To have a family, to own a house, travel the world, that's okay. That's good. If you want to do that, go for it. Be president of the United States. If you aspire to that, that's a good thing. Go for it. The question we have to ask ourselves is, why do I aspire to these things? Why do I want a job that makes me a lot of money? James 4.3 says, with regard to prayer, you ask and you do not receive. In other words, you aspire to great things and you ask for it from God. But why don't they receive? Because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. It's all about me. That's why I want all this stuff. I wonder with some of the people who are aspiring to be president of the United States why they want to be president of the United States. And I question myself sometimes. You know, just uh, recently I was contacted by a Wesleyan publishing house and they were asking me to write a book about living stones. And I brought that forward to our board, said, can we make time for this? Do we want to make time for me to do this? And I was asked, well, will this benefit you? And I knew the answer to the question was yes. And I knew that couldn't be the reason why I did it. It's not all about me. We need to know our motives. And why do we care so much about this stuff, these aspirations? What did Jesus defeat here? Jesus defeats fear of the future. I think the video that we saw from the, the Bible series showed it well. When, when uh, Satan was offering him all the kingdoms of the world, and they were flashing between him being given a, a golden crown and getting a crown of thorns on his head, or getting his feet anointed versus getting a nail on his feet. Jesus is looking at the future there. What future do I want? And we don't need to be afraid about our future. Matthew 6, 25 and 26, Jesus said, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat 
or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? See how our aspirational desires and our desires for security line up with also our physical sometimes? Why are we worried about the future? Well, I want to make sure I'm secure and I'm taken care of or my family's taken care of. But James 4, 13 through 15, James writes and says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. It's not that we don't aspire, it's not that we don't make plans, but what we're counting on is that the Lord will just let us live. Back to 1 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Jesus wins. So we win the power of self-control, and we win the power of freedom from fear. Those are two good things to have on your shelf. Last verse, verse 13 in Luke 4. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. One more thing. What did Jesus defeat? Jesus defeated perpetual desire. Perpetual desire. It says the devil gave him every temptation. We only have three listed in our gospel text, but it says over this 40 days, Jesus went through every temptation. Not merely every type of temptation. It doesn't say that. It said he experienced every temptation. Now, as I go to this next section, we need to realize that not every temptation has the same sway over every different person. Not every temptation has the same strength. I am not really, it's not a strong temptation for me to steal. I might have the opportunity to steal something at a grocery store or whatever. It's, that doesn't really pull me. But, on the other hand, every day I'm on the computer and my computer is connected to the internet and I know it would only take one click for me to look at naked pictures on the internet. And I have to be aware of that all the time. So, not every temptation is strong for every person. Some are stronger than others depending on just our makeup of who we are and what we have exposure to. So think about this. Jesus went through every temptation. So when Jesus was clearing the temple court to make room, getting rid of the animals and the money changers and stuff so people could pray, was he tempted to take those cords that he was driving out the animals and accidentally smack somebody with it that was being a jerk? Yes, he was. He was tempted in every way. When Jesus had the 5,000 men plus women and children and there was no food to eat except for one kid's lunch, was he tempted just to eat that himself? Yes, he was. He didn't. He was tempted to hoard. Hey, me and you, kid, this is enough for us. Let everybody else go fend for themselves. I'm hungry. I once went for 40 days without having any food. I'm not going to do that again. Let's me and you go eat. Yes, he was tempted to not share. When Jesus went to the house of Zacchaeus, was he tempted to say, Zacchaeus, why don't you give me some of that money? You got money. Yes, he was. He didn't do it. But he was tempted. And I don't know what the degree of his temptation to that was, but he was tempted. 
Do you think Jesus was tempted to do something bad to Judas Iscariot? Do you? He knew he was going to turn him in. You bet he was. Was Jesus tempted sexually? We don't often like to think of Jesus in terms of sexuality. But guess what? Everybody has sexuality. That's from the time the egg is fertilized. You have sexuality. A lot of the women, Jesus had a lot of women disciples that followed him around. And some of them were formerly prostitutes. Was Jesus tempted sexually? Yes. Absolutely. What about same-sex attraction? I'm not seeing Jesus had a strong desire towards that, but was he tempted that way? If he would experience every temptation, then he experienced that. Every temptation. And after he experienced every temptation, our translation said that the, the devil left him for an opportune time. That word opportune is not in there. It just says he left him for time. It's not that, okay, after 40 days, Jesus won, and the devil said, okay, and I'm going to go make a new plan. And so he doesn't mess with Jesus for for three years, and then he comes to get him to kill him at the cross. You know, the devil leaves Jesus alone for, for three years until the Holy Spirit. It just It's just saying, the devil left him for a little while, and then he was going to come back later. What it's saying is, Jesus was tempted for his whole life. It never stopped. You ever seen, there's different kinds of perpetual motion machines. The most common one you might see on somebody's desk is one of these Newtonian ball things where you pick up a silver ball on one side and drop it, and it hits the balls and it makes the other side bounce, and they keep bouncing back and forth, back and forth. And it just keeps going. Um, I kind of like this one on the bottom right. It's a water siphoning one. So water pours in and it starts a gravity feed and a siphon. That one will just keep going. The only thing that slows these things down is friction. If we lived in a frictionless world, they just keep going and going and going. And that's what it was like for temptation with Jesus. It just kept going and going and going, and the only thing that stopped it was death. The devil just left him for a time, but then he came back for a time. That's why the writer of Hebrews can say in Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things, just as we are, yet without sin. Jesus experienced every temptation, and he experienced it his whole life. And yet he is without sin. So whatever our temptation, know Jesus faced it, his whole life and he won you know there are some temptations that we may defeat and it's just kind of one and done I was tempted for that and and it didn't bother me that much and or maybe it was very hard but I overcame it and then there are some temptations that we may face our whole life my uh, Sunday school teacher when I was in junior high, uh, before he became a Christian, he was addicted to drugs. And he, he often shared, he said, he said, you know, some people when they're on drugs, it takes them a long time to get uh, off the drugs and they're still always tempted. He said, as soon as I became a Christian, I was no longer addicted to drugs anymore. And he says, the reason why I think God did that for me is because he knows me and I would have never gotten off of drugs if he didn't completely take it away. He said, I would have just never quit. And so God completely took it away, one and done for him. And yet, there, there's also, uh, there's a, a book out uh, called Redeeming Sex. And the, uh, the writer of that book 
um, she has dealt with a lot of people who deal with same-sex attraction. And she says, you know, for some people, as they mature, come to Christ and mature in Christ, that desire goes away. But for a lot of the people that she has dealt with, they struggle with that their whole life. Well, so did Jesus. Jesus struggled his whole life too. But he won. So if we walk as Christ walked, we win. Jesus wins. So we win the power of self-control. We win the power of freedom from fear. And we win the power to overcome temptation our whole life. Jesus wins, and you win. One last story. I heard about a person who was walking through a park, and they saw this oak tree, but a vine had grown up around this oak tree, and it appeared as though this vine was going to completely choke out this oak tree. I, the, the feelers were just so thick around this oak tree. The tree was in danger. But he looked a little closer and he realized that the gardeners had also seen this. And they had gone in and they had cut at the root all these vines. And so the vines were still on the tree, but they were no longer connected to the roots. And so over the course of weeks as it passed, those vines started to shrivel up and die, and the oak tree got stronger and stronger because it was no longer being choked by the vines. It would just gradually come. And that's the way it is or can be with sin in our lives. We're the tree. Sometimes those temptations feel like they're just choking us down like vines. What we realize, need to realize is Jesus, the gardener, he's already chopped those down. You know, just got to let them die. Gradually, the sin will just dry up and fall away. Let's pray. Today, I want to realize Jesus wins and we win. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations. And as you know the weaknesses of each of us, let each one find you mighty to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God forever.